mind can be explained fully in terms of the brain. But here we've got a model of mind which is independent. It functions in its own realm, then tells the brain what to do. The logic gate functions in both realms. It is, of course, a double-ended three-pin plug, and that's been the problem all along. People were looking to try and find a one-pin, uh, sorry, a one-ended three-pin plug, a bit like Descartes, who was trying to find a way by which the supernatural mind could influence the physical body, and he chose the uh, pineal gland, which is the only midline structure in the brain. In fact, it goes two ways, and that's of absolutely fundamental importance to a model of mind for psychiatry, that mind and body interact and influence each other. <coughs> Neurons function as logic gates, that much we do know. They code information, they manipulate it and pass it to the physical realm mindlessly. Neurons function as information processes in the somatic realm and as data channels in the physical realm. They are in functional continuity. The neuron is the point at which mind touches body and mind and body interact without breaching the laws of third dynamics. And this gives us the basis for a biocognitive model of mind for psychiatry. Now, I can only indicate this very briefly, um, and the slides really do start to get complicated from here on, but don't worry, I'll try and explain them. So, the logical structure of the biocognitive model that I've um, outlined elsewhere starts with common observation, that's your experience and my experience as thinking sentient beings. We have to explain that. We cannot pretend it doesn't exist, which of course is what behaviorism and biological psychiatry are trying to do. They're trying to get rid of the concept of the humans as sentient beings and reduce them to either stimulus response laws or neurons, bump, uh, sorry, molecules bumping into each other in the dark. We are constrained, secondly, we are constrained by evolutionary theory. That's the second box there. And we have to use as our... Um, as, as the limits of our uh, theorizing the philosophy of mind and of science. And the cognitive neurosciences, and that just means everything that um, really psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, neurophysiologists, uh, neuroanatomists, and everybody, um, and particularly these days, um, neurobiological chemists and physiologists, uh, everything that they, take they do takes place within this, the limits of phil philosophy of mind and science. And we add, of course, ethology, anthropology, sociology, and any other area of human um, uh, experience or knowledge which seems to have a bearing on why, why people do what they do. And out of these, we draw uh, the proposed solution to the mind-body problem, which, as I said, is that neurons function in two realms as essentially the, th the double-ended three-pin plug by which information transfers from mind and body and vice versa. Now, immediately this has a number of uh, consequences. The first one is that it prohibits the supernatural. Right? So there's no place in this model for a supernatural intervention. And that therefore prohibits fanatical religion. Now, I don't mean conventional religion. Um, I mean fanatical, the sort of religion where somebody says, um, dear God, please make this bomb go off amongst those people worshipping down there because I want to kill them all because they're my enemies. Now, that's the sort of thing that we try to stop um, that, that is absolutely barred by this, this model. This is a humanist model. And on the other hand, on the other side, it restricts pharmacy because it says that mind is a real thing and it has to be dealt with in its own terms. And we have to take into account, when we're trying to explain human behaviour, we have to take into account the mind of a person, not just his brain chemistry. And of course it denies fringe medicine, it limits fringe medicine. Uh, all of this silly stuff like Curlian photography and crystals and massage and um, chanting, all that sort of stuff, it stops a lot of that. Now, from our proposed solution to the mind-body problem, it goes directly to a theory of mind which explains perception, cognition, emotion and action. And I would, can't do that in this um, talk. All we're doing is indicating the areas that have been developed. And that theory of mind leads to four immediate major consequences. Firstly, a theory of human nature. Secondly, a theory of language, then of personality, and, of course, a theory of mental disorder. The theory of mind 
necessarily leads to a theory of mental disorder because it's simply mental disorder is simply mind going bad or going wrong. Um, to take the first of those two, theory of human nature, uh, yeah, we, there is a human nature. It's a very real thing, but in fact, it's a, it's not human nature. It's higher primate nature. And if you want to know what human nature is all about, go and watch a troop of baboons in their natural environment, and you'll see that they're social animals. Uh, they form bonds, um, that, but within that society, the little society that they form, they are they form dominance hierarchies, or so do humans. They're aggressively territorial. Uh, they are xenophobic, they fear strangers, um, and they're very possessive, and they've got a whole lot of other properties um, which are a uh, human share. We share them. Um, and that leads then, strangely enough, to a naturalistic theory of morality. One of the big criticisms of people, excuse me, um, who are told, yes, there can be a materialist theory of mind, their response is rather anxious, but what about morality? How can you include morality if there isn't a higher power um, ordaining the morality? Well, I think the answer is there is a higher power, but it's actually human nature which ordains the morality. So a materialist theory of mind is not necessarily amoral. In fact, there's a very powerful morality which comes straight from it. And from that, we get a theory of society and then a theory of law and law and society interact on the right-hand side of your screen, I've got a theory of language, um, which we'll have a look at shortly. That leads to a theory of epistemology, and thence to science and technology, which of course interacts with, with society as we know it. And on the other side of that original screen, I had a theory of personality, uh, which leads to a theory of personality disorder. And personality, just to summarise, is um, simply the sum total of interactions between an individual and environment throughout his life. But that's very clumsy definition, so we um, restrict it to mean the uh, habitual modes of interaction between an individual and an environment in his stable adult form of behaviour. And essentially what that does is reduce to the rules which govern those habitual modes of interaction. So personality becomes the set of rules that you use, general rules which you use to generate your specific instances of behaviour. And some of those rules we know and quite a lot of them we don't know. And because we want personality to be, to be a theory of differences, we leave out language, um, social mores and standards and things like that. So it's not um, the fact that men wear trousers um, that's significant, it's whether one man chooses not to wear trousers. Uh, that's, where, that's where it becomes important. And the theory of mental disorder, I um, won't go into that at the moment, that's a separate area. But from a theory of mental disorder and personality disorder becomes comes an ethical theory of psychiatry, which leads finally to rational treatment. Now the tests for this biocognitive model are, can we give an explanation for experience, for human nature, personality, personality disorder, language, morality and mental disorder. And they're the tests I've set, and I think if this biocognitive model can't give some sort of answer to each of those, then we should discard it. Um, I've uh, said at the moment um, experience is very difficult, but I've given a suggestion elsewhere, and I think it's, um, uh, it's, it's a reasonable sort of explanation. Human nature, I've just mentioned, is essentially a theory of human, uh, sorry, higher primate nature, personality and personality disorder. Or personality, if personality is the set of rules, then if your rules are such that they don't generate coherent behaviour, for example, if they're internally inconsistent, or if they contradict the rules of the larger society and generate distress and friction, then we'd have a theory of personality disorder. So personality in this model um, sorry, personality disorder in this model is simply a very untidy set of rules, and what it says is that the human mind in pers sorry the human brain in personality disorder is normal. So all these people who think that they can reduce personality disorder to brain disorder are barking up the wrong tree. Total waste of money. All that research. Theory of language. Let's just move on a little bit. Um, personality disorder. I won't worry about. Here, theory of language. Up the top here, we've got a sentence. The boy is eating some cake. And we break that down, what is called passing a sentence, P-A-R-S-I-N-G. Uh, we break it down into its constituent parts. And this is understood to be the process by which we extract meaning um, from sentences. 